I walked into the house and you've got to remember it's a, it's a mid terrace it's a very very small house mm. and there's this huge wooden box in the hallway and that huge wooden box he'd like aunties and uncles oh, wow. everybody just yeah, yeah. wailing and screaming and crying and this massive wooden box in the hallway like half the size of the hallway mm. and I didn't really know what 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 to think and what to expect and then at one of my aunties bless her she's looking down at me and she's like screaming her eyes out and I'm, I'm looking at her and thinking what is going on here and every, everywhere I'm looking it's like screaming screaming shouting screaming and look up at my auntie and she's looking down at me and she's like going what's going to happen to you what's going to happen to you and I'm looking up at her and thinking what do you mean what's going to happen to me she's like what is going to happen to you what is going to happen to you thinking, what do you mean and then she's looking up into the into the seal onto the ceiling and she's like god what have you done god what have you done why have you taken his uh, his father away from him why have you taken his father away that's the first time I heard that, you know, that, mm. that my father was not around. Welcome back to another episode of the Riz Podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and like, that's a problem. There's going to be no one else doing it. All the motivational context. No risk, no riz. Get following the YouTube channel now. He is the man. That's it. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Riz Podcast. Today we're sat with someone who uh, I've been... uh, Actually, since I started this podcast, somebody that I've really wanted to sit down with and have a conversation with. He's the founder of singlemuslim.com and founder and chairman of Penny Appeal one of the largest charities in the world, especially coming out of the Muslim community. So real privilege and honor to be sat with you here today, Anib. Jacques thank you so much. It's, it's, it's a pleasure to, to have you here. I've seen some of your work and uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan, mashallah, and it's, oh, uh, exactly. it's an honor to be part of that. Oh, thank you so much, bro. Your, your words are very and kind. I, and, I, and I love the, love the brand as well. I love the name. It's, uh, that, that's, that's kind of like what, we, uh, what, what, what I'm about, I guess, and uh, mm. in terms of reading that, and I thought, you know what, that, that makes a lot of sense, so mm. it's, uh, it's, it's quite funky, but it's quite deep at the same time. No, definitely. I'll, I'll tell you where it came from, actually. I was having a conversation with the sheikh, and uh, he was telling me, but long story short, he told me that there was a saying of the uh, pious predecessors, the Dabla Dabi, and I believe he said, and he said that they used to say that if you worked for someone, you would get one-tenth of your rizq, but if you worked for yourself and put your complete trust in Allah, then he'll give you the other nine tenths. Wow. So he said, without risk, there's, re- there's no reward. And then that's when I said, no risk, no risk. And then we had a little bit of laugh, and then it just stuck in my brain, and you know, here we are today, alhamdulillah. So, so that is literally the ethos that this brand is built upon, which is, you know, tuakal, basically. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, your story definitely <laughs> resonates with that, because, um, yeah, you, you definitely haven't gone the normal traditional route. Um, you know, you, you've done things which is outside of the box, and, and that's what... Um, I think I'm really excited about learning about yourself today then. So um, let's get into it, bro, then. So we all know who you are in terms of, you know, today where you're at, chairman of Penny Appeal, singlemuslim.com, uh, founder. W- where did it all begin, bro? We're, we're here in Wakefield. Uh, tell us about, you know, your, your early days. Where were you born? How, how did you grow up? And how did those early years affect who you are today? Yeah, alhamdulillah. I think uh, it's, it's a, it is a lifelong journey, I guess. And still on that journey um, every day and it sounds as corny as it does but every day is one of those you you, you see something you feel something you like something you want to you want to move you want to you, you want to work somewhere um, I guess my journey started uh, you know alhamdulillah alhamdulillah for everything I guess uh, my journey started when I was six year old mm-hmm. um, and at the time it was pretty normal Pakistani household uh, Mum and dad came from Pakistan. They married. They were together. Uh, lived in a mid-terraced house. Uh, dad worked in the factory. Uh, f- family was very close. Uncles, aunties. Everybody lived in a very, very small northern town. Uh, you know, it was pretty, pretty, pretty mundane. Um, then tragedy hit our family. My father sadly passed away. He had bowel cancer. May Allah have mercy on his soul. Um, and un unknown to me that's where I guess where that seed was planted I remember when I was uh, you know I remember on the day the, f- the days prior to that I mean you know, it's, it's just weird subhanAllah how smells and how sights and how you know like visuals trigger certain things 
Um, and I remember my father passing away when there were daffodils around because we used to take him daffodils to the hospital. So daffodils in the front garden, we used to pick the daffodils and take the daffodils to the hospital. And every time I see daffodils, I kind of associate it back to that hospital memory. Um, you know, Mary Curie, the, the, the cancer mm. um, organization has got a daffodil for its logo. And, it, 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 you know, it's, a, it's one of those where it, it, it triggers a lot. Um, and I remember coming home and uh, one day from school and there was just sh cars everywhere in the street. There was shoes everywhere um, outside the house and the front door was open and there were just so many people there and I could just see that from the bottom of the street. Um, and you knew that you got that kind of feeling and you, you know, that, that something is not right. You, uh, he was he was in hospital. He was ill yeah, at that period of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you've come home now from school. Yeah, obviously yeah, pre internet, yeah. pre phones, yeah, yeah, pre mobile yeah, yeah, phones. Yeah, 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 so yeah. no one's obviously like called you. Nobody's nobody can call you, right? Yeah, nobody. But so you've no. come, you're walking home and you're completely oblivious to the yeah. reality of what's happened. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah and yeah. you just walked into this home now. I walked into the house, and uh, you got to remember it's a it's a mid terrace. It's a very very small house, mm. and uh, there's this huge wooden box in the hallway. And that huge wooden box is obviously like aunties and uncles, oh, everybody just yeah, yeah. wailing and screaming and crying. And this massive wooden box in the hallway, like half the size of the hallway. Um, and mm. I didn't really know what 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 to think and um, what to expect. And then at one of my aunties, bless her, she's looking down at me and she's like, you know, screaming her eyes out. I'm, I'm looking at her and thinking, what is going on here? And every, everywhere I'm looking, it's like, screaming screaming shouting screaming uh, and look up at my auntie and she's looking down at me and she's like going what's gonna happen to you what's gonna happen to you and i'm looking up and thinking what do you mean what's gonna happen to me she's like what is gonna happen to you what is gonna happen to you I'm thinking what do you mean and then she's looking up into the into the seal onto the ceiling and she's like god what have you done god what have you done why have you taken his uh, his father away from him why have you taken his father away that's the first time i heard that you know that, mm. that my father was not around and then everybody just hugging me and kissing me, and uh, and I was like, wow, okay. Um, and that, yeah, that 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 was the moment. Actually, I locked that moment away uh, for the next twenty years of my life. I kind of pretended that 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 moment never happened. Um, and I remember so many times, you know, we were we were invited, and alhamdulillah, you know, our community is generous. Our our faith is very very generous, and our people embody that, and they really, you know, like really make sure that 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 happens. So we were invited to family weddings and family engagements and uh, and all sorts of you know on Eid and so on and so mm. forth. You know, but we weren't we would were, we weren't part of that immediate family, but we were part of the bigger community. But we'd get invited to everywhere because you know we were the yatim or the orphans mm. in the in the community, and we get hand me downs. So we get books and toys and clothes and all sorts of things. And people would say, you know, they'd, they'd talk to me and they say. You know what's your you know, like like uncles do? They say what's your what's your dad's name? Mm. They don't they don't know, they don't know who you are. They're like what's your dad's yeah, name? Yeah. I'd be like yeah, my dad's name's Eunice, and I'd be like which is Eunice? And then somebody would say, no no not that Eunice, the Eunice that's passed away. Mm. And I'd be like oh okay, come over here, put that, and they'd mm. put a hand on the head on my head, and they'd give me a a pound or a mm. five pound note or something, and I'd be like okay. So you know there was a there was that kind of like where people I guess feel sorry for you or feel pity for you or um, you know, think to yourself that you, there's not, you know, you, mm. that's it. It's a bit of a dead end road here. <laughs> he's not gonna, he's not gonna achieve much in his life. I, I want to ask at this point because I, I read that part in the book as well, and um, one of the things that 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 kind of reminded me of was uh, to completely lesser degree. There's no comparison between the two things, but um, there was, uh, you know, one person who I had a conversation with, and she said, you know, what do you want to be when you're older? And I said, I want to, I want to be a psych psych psychiatrist. And she said, psychiatrist, you don't have the grades for that. And then, so I forgot about that yeah. dream of being a psychiatrist. Right? I was like, okay, forget it. Although sometimes these podcasts do feel like that. Um, how, you know, when, when your auntie said that to you, did that give you any limiting beliefs? Or was it the opposite? Or, you know, at what point, I guess, did it really sink in for you? You know, there's, there's a couple of things I want to know. So that, that limiting belief. And then the other thing of like, you've got a father... You know, he, he he would have been active. He would have been doing things, and there's now that loss. Mm. There's a complete loss of that. You know, like an arm has been cut off or a leg mm, has been mm, cut mm, off. Mm, mm, mm. What's that feeling like for such a young boy? And then, obviously, growing up, how did that 
gap and that loss affect you? You know, the, the, the limitation, I guess, when my, when, my, when my auntie was saying that to me, she's like, oh, my God, what's going to happen to you? Oh, my God, what's going to happen to you? It was more scary than anything else because I didn't know what was going to happen to me. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I didn't. I remember looking up at her and she was just like screaming her eyes out and she was looking up to the, and talking to God like, God, what have you done? Mm. And I'm thinking, what, what's, what's going on here? Do you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? It's like a bit bizarre. I feel, I feel all right. I feel normal mm, with yeah, myself. Yeah, yeah. I've got all my loved ones around me. I've got, you know, my uncles, my aunties, my cousins are here. I, f- I, f- I feel all right. Do you know what I mean? I don't, there's nothing wrong with me, <laughs> but what is going to happen? I don't know. Is there, is there something that you know that I don't know? Mm, right. Okay. And why are you so scared for me? Why are you so scared for me? And I, did, mm. I didn't really know that. But then afterwards, I guess the kind of whole people feeling sorry for you and people, you know, pitying you and people like saying like, you know, going that extra mile for you and everybody else, like they just, were almost like the golden child or the, the child that, you know, they would get reward for touching your hair or they would get a reward for slipping yeah. you five pounds or they would get a reward for, you know, their children's old toys or old books. Do you, do you know what I mean? It was that mm. kind of thing. And I, and I, and I think... You're almost like this, this repository of like, if people do anything for you, then it's like a good deed that they can do. They, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I you're, never you're just that person that's walking around, and you're just a kid. And I didn't, I didn't yeah. realize this, but one thing I did know is I wanted to be independent of that. Mm. I didn't really, I didn't really like that. I didn't, I didn't really like people giving me that pity. Mm. And I think you know the other thing in terms of the your your arm being cut off or the analogy of being disabled in mm. in in one way, shape, or form. I think you know my my grandfather, may I have mercy on his soul, he was a, a World War Two veteran. Uh, and he had discipline and he had energy and he had focus and he had belief and he had positivity like I've never seen in any human being even till today mm-hmm. in my whole entire life. So as soon as I remember from an early age, he was ill. Mm. He was bed bound. He had a COPD. So he had like a nebulizer twice a day. He was on more medications than you probably bring home shopping on a weekly basis. Um, and he was constantly in and out of doctor surgeries and uh, it, he was a complete and utter like alhamdulillah the modern medication kept him alive mm. like beyond his beyond his days um, but he was always positive he'd always make an effort he'd he'd get ready for Juma. Mm. he'd get ready for Friday prayers Tuesday afternoon so he'd start putting his socks together he'd start polishing wow. his shoes start ironing his clothes he'd start making his routine he'd start asking who's gonna go which mosque you're gonna go mm. to and so on do you know what I mean so Tuesday evening, Wednesday evening, Thursday evening. Mm. Thursday evening would be like a party in our home, and then Friday he'd get to Juma, and then it'd be same. Do you know what I mean? It'd be yeah, like yeah, yeah. It'd be brilliant, and he would keep <laughs> it. He would keep an eye on every single person. He'd be the he'd be the the gel, the connector mm. for the whole family. So when you when you've got when you've got my grandfather, uh, my nana, so my mum's dad as a as a role model, and then my mum never ever let this kind of get to her. She was the first woman in our community who learned how to drive. She was the first woman in our community who had her own shop. So she started sewing clothes. She learned how to sew clothes. Then she started sewing clothes. Then she had her own market uh, trade business. Then she had her own retail business. So she was uh, on Brook Street in Wakefield. So she never let that get her down either. So she was just kind of get up and go and, you know, never let us uh, have anything less than anybody else. You know, always had the um, the branded you know, Nike Air Max when they came out and the kicker jumpers when they came out and mm. always had enough money to go on, uh, on, on, you know, on, on school trips and, you know, so on and so forth. So, but one thing that she did always, always, always say to us and, and bang that into our, our minds was that, you know, le- never let me down because you've not, mm. you know, I'm, I'm your mother and I'm your father mm. and never, ever let anybody down and never, let, never let me, you know, be shamed of bringing you guys up because it's not easy. So there was that burden of, I guess, it wasn't a burden of, like, we're going to go out and we're going to do what we want to do. It's a kind of like, it's the reverse almost. Like, you know, if you do something and if if you do something bad, that shame's going to come on me. And, mm. you know, you know that's not something that I want. So it was always a case of trying your best and trying, you know, trying to work that out. And then Alhamdulillah, um, I, guess, I guess following that and seeing those two role models in my life was something else. Mm. You know, like I, I see it now, the positivity that that brought and the energy that that brought and the kind of like, you know, nothing's ever a problem. Everything's a mm. problem, but nothing's ever a problem. Um, and then I went to Pakistan and I, and I discovered actually what an orphan means. Allah. So, you know, like here you looked after by the state, mm. so you got free, even though we were stood in the, the dinner queue, to, you know, the, the talk in the dinner queue. So there was a 
cash dinner queue and then there was a token dinner queue. So you know there must be something wrong with these <laughs> these people, you know, low 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 earning parents or you know single mm. parents or you know whatever it might be. And then you've got the normal children on this line. So you always, I mean, that's not the case anymore. But that that was always the the case growing up. It was like you were always like earmarked as some as as the other. Mm. Uh, but when you when I went to Pakistan, I actually realised what you know being an orphan is. You know, not having a father, not having a breadwinner in the family literally means you're either going to make it in life or you're not going to make it in life. So all those aunties and uncles and grandparents that I used to see in the community here in Wakefield, those that, you know, were feeling sorry for us or those those that gave me a five pound or a two pound or whatever it might be, they were doing it because that's that was their mindset that this person or this child is not going to do anything, mm-hmm. not going to accomplish anything in life. And that was their way of kind of like maybe trying to help you out. But mm. seeing firsthand it for myself, yeah. like, you, you know, I've come from a village where there's no roads, there's no gas, there's no electricity, there's actually no running water either. And the house that my father built for us as a family before he left Pakistan was literally a mud hut. And I've got more gadgets and gizmos in my double garage than they've probably got in the whole village, let alone the house. So that kind of give you a perspective on what what you're dealing with. So if destiny had it any other way, mm. I would have been born there. And if I was be, if I was born there, I would have not even had a, a, a single pair of shoes. Yeah, I was just going to say... It's just phenomenal, phenomenal play of, uh, play of destiny there. SubhanAllah. And, and, you know, there's, there's, there's so many things that we could unpack with just that because, you know, a lot of people, you know, they, they, they see this problem with, you know, they call it the problem of evil and suffering. You know, when somebody passes away and, you know, quote, quote, too early, then they kind of rebel against Allah and they say like you know there can't be a God what how could a just God do yeah, this yeah, yeah. and all these types of things um but then you know I think maybe potentially you you're possibly too young to even consider that you know you could have this argument with God but for your mum then I mean that is something that's quite astounding and astonishing because we're talking about you know maybe 20 20 25 years ago um in a condition where you know again we didn't have internet we didn't have mobile files or anything like this so if you wanted to go out and start a business you had to go out and do everything you know with your own two hands and so you know for a female especially in that time that must have been very very scary and so it's quite interesting that you know your, your mum would come back home and give you kind of the that confidence and that bravery mm. and almost like that pressure that she's having to put mm, mm, out mm. into the world right now. So mm. I think that's an amazing achievement. And I think, you know, mashallah, just from the little that I can see that you've done, mashallah, I'm sure she's very, very proud of everything you've done. And, and the other thing that, you know, looking at that as well is that, you know, when we look at Allah's plan, when you look at Allah's plan now, do you, do you, do you, see, uh, do you see benefit in the way that things have been played out? Or do you still have any types of like gripes with how, you know, your, your life had, had, had panned out. You know, you didn't have a father for, for most of your, 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 your life, especially those formative years, teenager, 20s, when mm, you're getting mm, married, mm, etc. Mm, so, you know, how do you see that from a, from a spiritual perspective? You know, alhamdulillah, and you, you learn so much, but you, sometimes you don't, I mean, that's learning as well, right? When, you, when you're going through life or when you're going through education and you might be absorbing knowledge, learning knowledge, but you're not applying that knowledge because it's only later on in your life that you apply the knowledge. Um, mm. And I, it's been 36 years now, 36 years, 1986, my father passed away. It's so it's a, it's a long, long, long time ago. It's, you know, it's... it's before it's, I was born. Uh, <laughs> 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 Mashallah. Bro, you look well. <laughs> you, you look, yeah. I've earned these. <laughs> I've earned these. <laughs> Silver stripes. Alhamdulillah. So, Alhamdulillah, it was a, you know what, the once I remember like being in Wembley and one of my uncles in London, uh, he, he's mashallah, super, one of my biggest fans, super duper proud of me. And he sat there with his sons and he's, he's talking to his sons and he's a bit, bit you know, like uncle's a bit desi. <laughs> and he's talking to his sons and he's saying, you lot are a bunch of useless kids and you lot don't do anything and you lot just rely on me and why do I have to, I have to do everything and you get out of bed late and da, 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 really having a go at his sons. And I'm thinking, you know, that's just... I guess what dads do and guess what you know they have to do to motivate his children and then he looks over at me and he says look at it look at Adim look at he's doing well he's doing he's doing some good work and I'm really proud of him he's a good lad he's a good lad I'm like okay uncle like maybe not 
not be that positive with me because you know what I mean I don't want to be sound I don't want to sound like a teacher's pet <laughs> you know what I mean exactly yeah. teacher's pets don't have many friends so <laughs> please just cool it off now and then he says to his children he says you know why that is and I'm like okay this like what's going to happen here it's a great reveal he goes that's because he's got no dad and I was like Ugh, that's a bit I thought, that's a bit below the belt <laughs> what's going on here and uh, he says he's got no dad so he's had to do everything himself and he's had to be self-reliant. He goes, you lot have got me, so mm. you don't, you don't, you don't, you're lazy and you rely on me and I've got to do everything for you. And I was, I was, I was a bit upset with him. I was really, really upset with him. I was thought, you know what, like, you could have said that in private or mm. you could have said that in a nicer way or you could have been kinder. Like, you don't have to say it like that. You know, do you know what I mean? Why, why are you being like, being like that? Anyway, dr- driving back up to Wakefield on the M1 um, and I kind of like just reflecting on what he was saying. And I thought to myself, actually, you know what? It does make sense. It makes a lot of sense. So that's the first time the penny dropped for me. Mm. I think you look at look at Allah's plans. Like he's he's made me an orphan, and he's prepared me to do or go through what I've been through, so I can help other orphans. And that's exactly what I did. When as mm. soon as as soon as we, the business started making some money, I really wanted to kind of go back and help those people in my village because I thought to myself that would that is what my father would have wanted me to do mm. my father would have wanted me to be responsible my, well my, what what would what would my father have done my father would have helped his brothers and sisters in the village that he's from mm. my father would have put wells in that will, village my father would have built homes for those people got those people out of debt put education system in in, in there mm. to bring those people up and to help those people kind of better their future oh, no. um and I guess that my shoulders felt heavy at that time because I th- thought, you know what, mm. I have to do something. I have to do a little bit, even if it's not going to be a lot, I have to do a little bit. And that's when I guess the, 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 the seeds were planted in terms of let's just, you know, make that a reality and kind of push that home. Because, you know, when you're making money in business and wh- how many how many beds are you going to sleep on, how many hotels are you going to stay in, how many mm. meals are you going to eat, you might eat a nicer meal but you're not going to eat 100 meals. You're going to still going to eat one meal, two meal, three, you know, mm. filling meals a day. And to be honest with you, people these days don't want to eat that much either. Do you know what I mean? They want to look after their figure. They want to be vegans. They want to eat less. They want to, do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, yeah. how many cars are you going to drive? How many houses are you going to live in? Mm. It just feels like, it, it feels really unnecessary and it feels a bit vulgar and it feels a bit like, like you know, life is not that long, really. Mm. You know, I lost my father when I was six. My eldest child now is 15. Mashallah. Um, so, you know, I, I've been blessed with mm-hmm. living more time than my father had with me than I've had with my eldest child. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, like I could be gone like today or I could be gone tomorrow. And genuinely, genuinely, like a lot of my friends, they 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 have these retirement funds and they've got this saving and that saving and this pot maturing and the assets over here in this country and over in that country and more wealth they can they can the next two three generations could spend to be honest and you think to yourself why are you putting this away like a squirrel do you know what I mean like <laughs> why are you, mm. why are you why are you putting this in all these places that you've even forgot <laughs> where half of it is mm. and what are you going to do with it you know what I mean what what are you actually going to do with it if islam is a real positive religion where it gives that positivity to you and i remember when, you know, losing my father, a lot of people was, would come to me and they'd say, "Look, he was a beautiful guy. He had, you know, he he had a a real nice order about him, and they would always share fond memories of him." And they'd say, "Because Allah Subhanahu wa Taala loved him, He took him away young." Mm. And you know, th- those kind of those kind of things always kept kept me going. That those stories, mm. hearing of him, but but then Allah loving him, we love him. Our family loves him. Our family misses him. But Allah loves him as well, and mm. that's why Allah's taking him at a young age. Um, so I thought, you know, that that was a again, it's about being, being positive, isn't it? It's about taking the positivity out of every 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 situation that you're in, and you're saying Alhamdulillah for every situation, no matter how high or how low that situation is. Just saying Alhamdulillah and just keep driving along. That's uh, very inspirational, bro. Because uh, you know, you, you you said a phrase there that uh, I really felt, which is you know that your your shoulders were heavy, you know, and I really felt that. And you know, I think today we would call that you know anxiety, or we'd call that you know all these different types of things, right? And I think at that time there was no time for that, right? There's no time to think about yeah. how am I feeling. It's just about action. 
And you know, you can see that that runs through in the work that you're doing, uh, you know, up until today. And so, I do want to fast forward this now because it's connected. Because you you went to university, yeah. Um, and I guess the plan was work hard, go to university, get a good job. Six, you know, forty years later, yeah, retire. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, know yeah, what I mean? And, yeah, and, yeah. and there you go, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. But what happened with you when you were in university, then, bro? Like, what? Like, obviously, <laughs> you know, you didn't go through with, you know, the, the climbing a corporate career ladder, right? Um, you know, you, you were working on some yeah, of your own yeah, projects. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, singlemuslim.com was that your first ever project that you worked on, or had you worked on any other type of entrepreneurial ventures before? Yeah. So, uni for me was very interesting. So I changed uh, university courses a few times, and I remember uh, one of my uncles, is my mamu, my mom's brother, who's no longer with us. May Allah have mercy on his soul. Uh, legendary guy, you know, used to used to just always give us a lot, a lot of love, give us a lot of time, give mm. us, you know, he was the the, the kind of ca- clown in the family. Mm. But one thing that he was, you know, that I kind of I miss a lot is the support. So whatever you did in life. If you did something wrong, you'd be like, you know what? It's okay. These things happen. Mistakes happen. Don't worry about it. If you did something good, you should always celebrate the mm. good as well. In a kind of like an English way, not in a desi way. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because he was young when he came here. So we thought, you know, this uncle gets it. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so I remember at university, I um, I went to do a, an IT course. And uh, six weeks into the IT course, I put the, the, the lecturer asked me a question. He says, Adeem, where have I lost you? Where have I lost you? And, and, <laughs> and I was a bit cheeky and I said, six weeks ago, sir. <laughs> he says, get out, get out. So I walked out and, and I, never, I never walked back in again. I just walked out. I spoke to my uncle and I said, look, what do I do? Because like, I, I really don't, I'm not really, I'm really not interested. And my uncle said, look, when your father came here, he yeah. had to work in the mills. Why did he have to work in the mills? Because he had no other option mm. but to work in the mills. So he had to make a living for his family. He had to pay. He had to send some money back to, to Pakistan for his his brother and his you know his rest of his family over there. Mm. He says, but you don't have to do that. You know why are you doing something that you don't enjoy doing? Mm. You've got the you've got the ability to to do what you love doing and at the same time make a make a, a living out of it. I naturally had a, a talent for marketing. I naturally had a talent for kind of IT, but not kind of coding. More in terms of like you know tech and. Uh, product management, fu- product and, management yeah. and kind of like futuristic tech and you know that that type of thing uh, more UI so I started kind of going into that and so I went to New- Newcastle University I want to be a big boy now I'm going to go out to Newcastle and spend some time away from home and that was the month that I was I was feeling so guilty I had such a great time some nights in freshers week we didn't even come home do you know what I mean it was like <laughs> out lectures out lectures yeah. <laughs> it's like <laughs> doing crazy stuff and like then scrummaging around in, in, in your suitcase and thinking, where did mum pack that masala? Let me find the masala. <laughs> Let me find the Quran. Let me find the local mosque. Need to, need to, need to do something like this is getting lost here. I need to get back to, get back to, you know, what, what life's about. Mm. So I spent a month there and I had a really great month. Um, the weather was terrible. It was really bad. If you think the weather, you know, not, not, not great up here. Imagine going a bit further up north. So I came back and, uh, I, finished my degree off at Le- Leeds University. Mm-hmm. And when I was at Leeds University, um, I started doing a side hustle. Like, I guess it's in the blood, isn't it? It's mm-hmm. like you don't train to be an entrepreneur. You don't kind of like train to have startup businesses. People do. But I guess it's the natural ability just to, flo- just to flow. Mm-hmm. What, what happens, just kind of carry on going with the flow and, and making problem, it work. Find the problem, solve the problem. Exactly. Charge it, a fee for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember um, doing a few different businesses at, at at, even at school, I was hustling. At col- college, I was hustling. At university, I was I would hustle them. Like I said, find the problem, identify the problem, research the problem, find a solution, and 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 deliver the solution. Mm. And one of my good friends at university, we were doing a, a, a course together, uh, and he said, uh, "I've got a really great idea." And I, and I said, "Yeah, okay, let's have a look at this idea. I'm not going to share it with you." And I said, "Why not?" I got a bit offended. I said, "Why not?" He says, "You're going to roll it up and you're going to start selling it, <laughs> and." I'm going to just be thinking about it. And I thought, that was the first time I thought, you know what, I'm a little bit different mm. because I'd like to just make things w- happen. It's all right, having a great conversation. It's all right, doing all the rest of it, but let's just get it over mm. the line. And uh, so one of my little hustles at university was doing design, so marketing design, photography. Back in those days, it was magazine design. So, you know, 
page layouts and cover designs and so on and so forth. And you get you get a bit of business here, get a bit of business there. I remember st- at Staples, um, stood in the queue at Staples, and this guy was printing a catalog. So he was printing a catalog of brake drums and discs. So the you know HGV lorries and whatnot. Their brake drums and discs are manufactured, and they're really. Exp- I mean, it's a multi-million, hundred million, billion pound industry. Um, big, big business. All the all the trucks and lorries in the world, obviously, they, they need those. So then you got the original parts, and then you got the aftermarket parts. So this old chap sat in, st- stood in the queue at Staples, and he's telling this lady, saying, "This is very expensive, and you should not be charging this much." And and it's like, by the time you've printed it, it's going to go out of fashion. And I was like, tapped him on the shoulder. I said, "Why don't you have a website?" Mm. So we're looking at back back in nineteen ninety eight, nineteen ninety nine. He looks at me and says, "Kid, what are you talking about?" I says, "Why don't you get a mm. website?" says, what's one of those and how do I do one of those? And I said, start doing a little pitch to him. So he was some big guy. Anyway, um, he took my number and an hour later, he phones me up and he says, we want to talk to you. My, my boss wants to talk to you. Come to the office. So I went to the office, did this pitch and the boss liked it. He said, we've got a f- like a, our foundry, our you know main offices in South Africa and the big our big, big boss is going to fly in next week and he's going to come and see you. So I thought, okay, well, uh, we haven't got a fancy office. We've got a small, very, very small office on top of a pizza shop. And, uh, you know, if he wants to come to the pizza shop, we can even do him a pizza. So come at three <laughs> o'clock and at four o'clock, he can have a pizza. <laughs> and this old Scottish gentleman with tweed and, you know, like pocket square and everything, he pulled up at the office and I came down to see him and I was so embarrassed when I met him. Because I thought to myself, it's come in this fas- fancy Jaguar, it's come all the way from South Africa, uh, and whatnot, and then when we stood outside the pizza shop, he started talk, talking to me about speakers, like he was a bit of a connoisseur mm. about speakers. So he has to be a Bose speaker. He has to this surround sound, da 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 da. Car speaker system. His, his car his car speaker system probably cost more than my house. <laughs> you know what I mean? And he was such a geek about these kind of things. And I said, "Come this way. Let's go to the office." And then we got to the. I, I even forgot about this at the at the time. Right, it was a big. It was a big guy. I said, you're going to have to duck underneath the pizza counter. <laughs> and he looked at me. I said, I'm really sorry, but the, the, there's this way or there's the other way. And it's, it's not really that nice and, you know, smells nice and whatever. <laughs> he says, no, no, I'll try. I'll try, young man. So he ducked under the pizza counter and then went up these stairs and uh, steep stairs. Then went into the, the office and we'd, we'd kind of like, you know, bought some new desks and bought some new furnishing and hired a projector to do this presentation. And did this big, uh, big kind of like, you know, went to, went to Staples again, printed it all out. Anyway, it was a huge price that we were charging, like, for the website, for mm. the photography, for the design, for the search facility and all the rest of it. So he did the classic businessman thing. He turned the thing over and looked at the back page first and looked at the price and then turned it back around again. He's <laughs> like, OK, let's talk now. Um, it was a great, great conversation. He loved us to pieces. And actually... What was so refreshing at the end of the conversation before the pizza, he said, you know what? I like you and I like you because you don't have the fancy Manchester city centre offices. You don't have Mm. the fancy cars on hire that they can't afford. You don't have the big lifestyle and you've got the hunger in your belly that you want to you want to get somewhere. Mm. Um, So we got we got exactly what we wanted. In fact, we got more. But what he did to ensure that we didn't end up being having having the fancy offices, he did all this stage payment, and he did you know he did did that, and then he twinned us up with his offices in South Africa, and we worked we worked really really closely, and we had the, a big contract for a for a number of years. So then we had we had pizza. So he um, what what he did was we, pizza came up in a takeaway box, obviously on the on the the newly bought desk, the uh, the meeting room desk. So we had some paper plates and he pulled out a knife and fork and, <laughs> and, he, was and he was ready for it. he pulled out a knife and fork from his pocket as well and I was like brilliant brilliant you can see you know in that moment I thought to myself some people you can see why they're successful in life because they just go they just go get it they just go they just go get us mm. he came in he was open to the idea of this web development you know company mm. being on top of a pizza shop he, he looked at us and he didn't judge us he went with it and he was prepared as well because mm. I invited him for a pizza and he came with his knife and fork because he, he knew it was going to be a, up above a pizza shop. Yeah, 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 <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. And, that, and I guess, you know, that that was where the business started from. You said, you asked me where the, uh, sorry about the long 
the long story. No, that no, no. You, you asked me where the business started from. So that was the first time we started working that way. But even then, I thought to myself, I can't scale this. You know, if we do a catalog, that means I'm going to have to employ five people to do a catalog. Then if we do, you know, some more work, I'm going to have to employ two photographers. I'm going to have to employ some data guys. I'm going to have to employ some developers. Mm. So when we get work in, and I, I realized back then that the more sales you do, the bigger sales team you need, the more... I, and I was looking for something that has scalability. Mm. And it was waiting for me under my nose because at the same time as I had this huge problem of business and how do I grow my business and how do I get more clients? How do I get more Daves? Because Dave was the, the sales guy that I met at Staples. How do I learn how to get more Daves? How do I actually make that into a... How do I actually make that into a number? Like where, where do you get a Dave from? How, mm. do you, how do you target a Dave? How do you convert a Dave? Um, my mum had a massive different challenge for me at home. My mum had a super challenge. So she, when I got home, there would be photographs on the mantelpiece of my first cousins in Pakistan and other kind of rishtas that mum had. And it's like, okay, mum was like, right, you're, you're graduating from university next year and you need to get married now. So there's a great rishta here. She's a fantastic cook. She can make really good chapatis and she can make, you know, and, and you know, I'm a bit lonely myself as well and I need someone to talk to me around the house. So she can talk to me around the house as well. And I was like, oh my God, this is like, I don't want to marry my first cousin from Pakistan. You know, my, my, my uncle's daughter. I don't want to marry someone that you want me to marry from some random village, mm. which you had some childhood memories from. Uh, I don't want to marry somebody because they're a good cook. And I, yeah, it'd be nice if they were good friends with you, mum, but I'd rather them be better friends with me. Mm. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's like a bit strange. And then when I went back to university and I was at these Islamic society events and uh, we were at these gatherings, I realized that my problem that I was having wasn't just my problem. The problem and the challenge that I was having and that was I was facing was the same for pretty much every single person at university. I knew some amazing brothers. Like I was like, I thought to myself, mashallah, such a humble, such a hard worker, praise, you know, God-fearing, um, intelligent, well-mannered, I thought, to, you know, even back then I thought if I had a daughter, I'd love my daughter to marry someone like that. You know, if my sister was, you know, I'd, if, you know, looking for a rich dad, my si I would want my sister to marry someone like that. And at the same time, I was, I was meeting sisters that were really eligible and again, you know, had all the God-feeling qualities, you know, good-looking, hard-working, family-orientated. And then these guys were like in two separate camps because, mm. you know, Islamic society events, there was always a curtain in the middle and, brothers on that side the sisters on that side i thought how do you how do mm. how do you meet and the mosque was the mosque were not facilitating this mm. and the mosque still don't facilitate this mm. the community centers don't facilitate this aunties and uncles mainly aunties rich aunties they still they don't have their tentacles if you can call it in the network you know in and talking to those people who actually need the mm. the service and that's where singlemuslim.com was born and uh, I came back to the office uh, as we were doing the break drums and disc brochures and I was, as we were up to our eyeballs in catalogs and all that kind of tech and whatnot, I said to the guys, I've got this great idea. Why don't we set up a website for Muslims looking for marriage? And the guys looked at me thinking, are you for real? Like, we've got so much work to do and you want to set up some website for Muslims? Like, what, what, you, what are you on? Like, but anyway, so I convinced them over a few weeks and I says let's let's just do it anyway let's just quit let's just create a form let's just create one form mm. let's create a logo let's create this so downtime evenings and weekends I managed to squeeze the website out of them um, and literally when we launched the website um, boom it was like within five minutes we had our first registration wow. within five hours we had our first payment um, and the rest is pretty much history. The and five hours you had your first payment. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah That's yeah, nuts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what was your what was the what was the price model? Was it like you sign up and you have to pay a fee to sign up, it's or was pay, it advertising or what? Pay, paywall. So it's a subscription service. Okay. Uh, like all the the, the dating apps are. Mm -hmm. um, so we kind of right. followed a traditional dating model, mm -hmm. but we made it kind of specific specific Muslim for Muslims mm -hmm. by Muslim. Um, targeting and tailored to a Muslim audience. Do you pray? Mm. Have you been on Hajj? Do you keep halal? What kind of background are you from? Mm -hmm. And just making sure and advising people that this is not a, you know, fly by night, you know, like 
one night stand type of website. This mm. is a serious website for marriage purposes only. If you want to do other things, I'm sure there's more, there is definitely more websites to do those type of having those frivolous type of relationships. But this is something mm. that's serious. This is something that's there for the purpose of, of completing your faith, which is such a huge purpose. Mm. Um, and so many, so many stories. But the first time that, um, we didn't have no money back then. There was zero money, like literally no money. So we, we just developed and pushed and did the hustle. And I, I don't know if you remember, uh, so we did all the, the, the eye socks and whatnot. And then I don't know if you remember the um, the first anti-war demonstration in... in yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, George Galloway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Iraq yeah, yeah, and there's yeah, a million yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. Million, million man match. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. I was there yeah. too. So it was another million people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So what we did was we went to Staples again. I didn't, I, I didn't realize Staples had such a <laughs> significance in my life. So we went back to Staples again and we couldn't afford like printed leaflets and flyers. So we d- printed off a, an A4 sheet and then we did like little slithers. So like a compliment slip size, but half a compliment slip size. So okay. we just get, used a guillotine. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. Like, so we made one sheet of A4, but then that, that had like five or six little mini flyers on it. So as people were demonstrating, we obviously identified the... Sorry, sounds a bit racist, but we identify the brown people, <laughs> <laughs> the hijabi people, the the, the bearded people, the topi weary people, yeah, and we said, look, yeah. make love not war, and it's like giving out these fl- flyers, mm. make love not war, get married using singlemuslim dot com, make love not more, get married using singlemuslim dot com, make love mm. not war. So as the as the people would come past us, we'd be walking against mm. the crowds and hand the leaflets out, hand the leaflets out, sit slam sister, slam brother, hand the leaflets out. Most people would be like, Walaikum Salaam, take the leaflet off us, look at it, and then look up, think, what? <laughs> what have you just handed <laughs> me here? But if we're too late there, we'd be, we'd be off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then we do the same at like student gigs and, 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 and whatnot, um, mainly Islamic societies up and down the country. And then we were at an Islamic event. I don't know if you remember, well, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf has come to the UK a lot, but not been to the North that many times. Mm. He was in a mosque in uh, Leeds. And we were outside doing our flyering again, guerrilla marketing, as I called it back then. And we just took every opportunity, wherever there was groups of, of Muslims, we, we were there, um, like, yeah, pushing, pushing our message. So Sheikh Hamza Yusuf comes to Leeds, we're outside the mosque. There's this one brother, and he's like six foot four, massive, built, kind of walking in his jubba, looks down at one of my friends and says, whose is this website? My friend kind of looks at him and thinks like, I'm going to get beat up. He's like, <laughs> it's his website. <laughs> it's like, and I'm like, I can hear this conversation. I'm thinking, cheers, bro. Like, like you're gonna, just, he's going to come and <laughs> smack me in the face anyway. I walk up to him and I says, Salaam alaikum, brother. How can I help? And he just said, I just want to give you a big jazakal ahead. And I was like, what? He goes, thank you, man. Give me a big bear hug. <laughs> and he says, remember, remember so-and-so, so-and-so university and remember this event and I seen you there and you give me the leaflet and I'm like, yeah, yeah. And not, I didn't remember anything. I was like, yeah, 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 I remember. And they go, he says, I went onto your website and I found somebody and now we're married. And I was like, wow, this thing works. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, this thing actually works. Goose pimples on my back and I'm like, oh my God, it's like a moment. Mm-hmm. And, and that was it. That was it. We never, we never, from that moment, that kind of motivated me so much. And I was like, come on, guys, we need to mm. do this. We need to create this form. We need to create this. We need to create this and there. We need to get better at this. We need to get better at that. We just kept pushing and pushing and pushing. And I remember, like, you know, thinking to ourselves, like, we started from nothing and now we've created this platform. And literally, like, at that time, we were all over YouTube. We were all over Facebook. We were everywhere and the early adopters i mean i know our community is very very much a laggard community so you know everybody's doing it and then our guys come on right at the end thinking we found something genius like no 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 this 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 has been here for five years guys you've just not discovered it so i think we were early we were really early and i even now there's so many dating apps out there Mm. that copy mainstream um that copy tinder and copy whatever else and they're not, they're not built for the p- right purposes. I mean, then we built something that was a community service and we built it because we wanted to help the community and the community wasn't funding us, so we had to self-fund. Mm. So now there's all this like startup and scale up and entrepreneur and all these lovely, lovely great words that people use mm-hmm. to describe what is basically in essence solving a problem and having the, you know, having the, the mindset and having the audacity in a way and having the guts to go and 
push against the grain and really find something that some everybody else is saying that that's a waste of time what you're doing that for we were early i mean we set up in 1999 before the dot-com boom in 2000 and then i guess the business really started taking off in 2005 uh, and that's when we started really making some serious money mm. and and from there we've gone global and you know alhamdulillah it's uh, it's been a it's been it, it's not been an overnight success story these things are never an overnight success story uh, but you know that was a, that was the start of something which has been very very special for us. And now we've got over two hundred fifty thousand marriages that have happened that Absolutely. we know about. Over five million members globally, mm. um, and you know I go to a lot of, alhamdulillah, I go to a lot of events and marriages and and so on and so forth. And there's very few events that I, I, I go to and people say to me, look, you know, if, if they know about single Muslim and they know I'm I'm, I'm part of the the team, they're like, oh, wow, you know, we found our, I found my husband on there, I found my mm -hmm. wife on there, my friend, my brother, my si you know, a sibling or son, daughter found their partner on there. They've got now three children, two children, whatever it might be. Mm. And it's great that we've had that, we've had that much impact on the society mm. and help. And, it, and, and for me, I don't see it as a, I see it as a dawah opportunity. I see it as a dawah organization in that sense. You know, yes, mm. it is a business but it's a business where you're helping muslims get together and you're helping them complete their faith and then you're helping them have children in an islamic environment in an islamic family mm -hmm. and you know almost acts as a sadhaka jariya for you as well isn't it a huge sadhaka jariya you know like we set up what is it now 24 years ago mm, wow. so if you met in that if you met in that first year like the brother did from leeds yeah, yeah, yeah. And you've had a child that that child could possibly be 22 years old. Already graduated and graduated working. and ready to use singlemuslim.com again. <laughs> <laughs> circle of life repeats the, itself. The circle of life is is there. So we're, you know, I see I see myself as a as kind of an old school entrepreneur in that sense, and the granddad and the pioneer of the Muslim dating space. Mm. Uh, somebody who's really kind of been able to help others and get others to see the space for it, what it is, and 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 be part of the the community of, of dating sites now that are that are there to help mm. the Muslim community. I think one thing that came to my mind, which is quite beautiful actually, is, um, you know, uh, I'm not sure if it's in the Quran or it's a hadith, but, you know, uh, in, in our tradition we say that, you know, um, marriage is written 50,000 years before we were even created. And so isn't that nice that you're part of that story, you know, uh, 50,000 years before the creation of Earth. Part of that story of these people coming together was the creation of singlemuslim.com. So, you know, I don't know if you thought of it like that before, but, you know, it's, uh, it's quite interesting. And, and so I, I just want to touch upon one thing and then we transition to Penny Peel because it's, two, it's actually like a common theme, um, which is that you wanted to focus on the Islamic sector. Yeah. Um, obviously, Penny Peel does a lot within the local community for non-Muslims as well, but I think, you know, everyone knows it as a Muslim-focused charity yeah, at yeah, least. Yeah. So from, from singlemuslim.com then, you, you mentioned that, you know, it, it started to bring in some good money now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so with money comes a lot of options, a lot of choices. Um, when you started seeing the money, were you married at this point? Did you ever feel like you lost yourself? I know you said that you had a period of time in Newcastle where that kind of happened. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, when, the, when when money comes in, did you just think, oh, now I can go to a casino? Maybe that's an extreme example, but you know, <laughs> maybe I'll go to Miami and you know, just live up on a yacht. Maybe I'll do this. Maybe I'll go here. Yeah. Maybe I'll do this. Did those thoughts ever come into you? And then and the reason I ask is because you, you had this point of almost nihilism where you're like, what's the point of all of this? What's yeah, the point yeah, of having yeah, these yeah, things? Yeah, and, yeah. you know, and you, I, I heard you compare filling up your petrol to the cost of sponsoring an orphan, yeah, yeah. you know, and just having that realization of this amount that I'm using that is going to be empty by next week and is just here for me to just sh yeah, almost yeah, almost yeah. like show off yeah. uh, in that sense could be used to actually save somebody's life. So when you started seeing the income come through, what's happening to your mindset and your mentality at this point? And then <clears throat> how does this actually lead you into Penny Appeal? So that, that's, that's an important transition as well because like in 1999, singlemuslim.com was set up 2000. 2005 is when it really kind of bedded in, so five years. And I think any startup business, you've got to give it three to five years to like find its feet, 10 years, and it's, it, it's, it's there. So um, 2009 is when Penny Peel was set up, it kind of formally 
registered with the Charity Commission, so it's 10 years after the, the, the formation of, uh, of Single Muslim. Um, and I think, you know, obviously at the time I was single when I, was set, when I set up Single Muslim. <laughs> so um, Solving your own problem. So, <laughs> 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 what, do they, what do they say? The, uh, what, there's, a, there's a saying, isn't there, in terms of, uh, uh, I forget the saying now, that's the uh, mother of all, uh, mother of all, yeah, there's a, uh, what is it now? How does, how does that saying go? Is it, I don't know. We have to dub it in now. That we have to dub it, we have to dub it in, <laughs> we, have to, we have to put it in somewhere. Um, necessity. Oh, so there's yeah, a, there's there's a, there's a saying which I love. Yeah. Necessity is the mother of all action. Yeah. Um, and obviously, like you know, I was I was single at the time, and I was like, you know, if it works <laughs> or if it doesn't work, or how am I going to find somebody? In my mind, I couldn't really, I couldn't really see the person that I was going to get married to, because I thought to myself, like, I'm looking for that individual. That individual is looking for me. But where is that individual on planet Earth? Like, mm -hmm. the, where is that individual? Like, I don't know where they are. They don't know where I am. It's really weird. Anyway, so um, obviously when I've set up Single Muslim, I've, had, I've, I've tried it out myself. Of course, I have, you know, I've been on some halal dates, as you want to call it. Did, um, you, ever, did you ever block or hide any of the, 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 the girls that you were dating or that you went to see or anything like that? No, nah, no, nah, it was all, <laughs> it was literally like, literally part of the process. I was, I was... I had my own profile, I had my photographs, okay, I had okay. all the details so on there. you didn't say to develop a listen, just, just like hide this put, one. Put, put someone that... <laughs> 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 Absolutely not. No, no, no. Because obviously the, the, the development team would be thinking this is weirdo. Do you know what I mean? I had a bit of a, I had a, bit of a reputation at the office as well. <laughs> so I met, I met people from up and down the country. I met people from different backgrounds. I met people at different stages of their life. Um, I remember meeting a really like what I thought at that time was a perfect young lady from Scotland. Um, so she was half Yemeni and half English. Her father was a, a Yemeni surgeon. Her mother was a, a Scottish nurse. So they met together, obviously, at work. Um, and we got on really, really well. We got on so well. Um, the attraction was there. The, men the mental stimulation was there. The You know, we were on the same page. We had the same kind of like like vision of life and what where we wanted to go and and how we wanted to be um so we had that kind of like british muslim core foundation and she had a, a brilliant respectful up upbringing i thought she's the one and she absolutely broke my heart she absolutely broke my heart she said uh, i think this is not going to work and i like oh my god what do you mean it's not going to work and she says it's not going to work because um i've got too many complications in my life and i'm half yemeni and i'm trying to find my identity i might Scottish, am I Yemeni, am I, you know, what? who am I? And throwing a Pakistani in the mix is going to make it even more, like, just this cocktail is going to be too much for me. <laughs> and I thought, you know what, I love you even more, <laughs> because, like, you're so sensible. <laughs> and I thought, anyway, so that was a journey, and I went through a lot of, like, finding myself. And I think at the beginning, it was really easy. Well, it, in my head, it was really easy. I just need to find a girl, right? Mom says I need to get married to a girl. There was none of this LGBT <laughs> kind of like mind boggling stuff that was going on. It was a girl and it was a guy. And it was a guy. It was a girl. So I need to find a girl, right? Okay, it needs to it needs to be a girl. How difficult can it be? Then when you meet somebody, it's mm. like, yeah, well, I don't like that, and I like that more. So I kind of find something with more of that and less of this. Mm. A little bit less of that, a little bit more of that. Mm, that was good. Uh, okay, maybe not that much of that of that. It's like, okay, what are you it's like? Are you kind of what what you what are you creating here, <laughs> and does that even person exist? Well, if you had that person, that person, and that and that person, and that person was a bit that, like what are you what are you doing here? It's not it's not like um, you know you're not going to make somebody. You're going to find somebody who's already had this experience in life. So I met my first wife from SingleMuslim.com, and uh, I remember the story. <coughs> and it was a you know we met, and she didn't know that I was on the website. Um, she didn't know I owned the website, sorry, which was quite a bizarre thing as well. So I met her like anybody else would. At that time, you know what? I got really sick of messaging people and being really like mm -hmm. indirect. So I thought, um, I remember the message went something like, Salam, I like your profile. Have a read of mine. If you like my profile, please call me. <laughs> 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 and that was it. And lo and behold, guess what happened? I got a call, so I said, hello, hello, hi, hi, uh, who's this? Uh, it's, 
oh, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. I'm like, no, 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 who is this? Like, I don't get calls from random females. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, who is this? Um, no, 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 it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. I'm like, no, no, but who is this? Uh, no, I says, oh, okay, have you got my message of single Muslim? Uh, yeah, I said, okay, I'm really, I'm in a meeting right now, I'm really busy, can I call you later? Yeah, okay. So I, I put the phone, I'm like, Okay, right now who did I who did I send that message to? <laughs> I was like, oh. Okay, anyway, so I called later uh, in the evening. Our mum had a shop, so I parked outside mum's shop. I uh, went to pick mum up, and she'd not finished yet, so I just carried on talking to mum and uh, carried on talking. Well, as as I was waiting for mum, I thought, you know what, I've got some time now. Let me let me call this uh, this young lady back. So I called her back. We were chatting, we were chatting, and as we were talking. She says, do you speak Patwari? So that's the the dialect from where we are in Pakistan. I says, yeah, not very well, but I do speak it. She says, okay, can you maybe talk Patwari? Like, that's that's really bizarre. That's like really, really bizarre. I'm like, okay. So I started talking Patwari and it was like really cringy and really embarrassing. And then the first thing that she said to me was, my mum and dad are going to really like you. And I'm like, okay, if that's, mm. if that's the top of your checklist, then that'll do for me. <laughs> um... And then, yeah, we just like really carried on talking, down to earth. Somebody was really like compassionate. Somebody was really family orientated. Somebody was just normal. Do you know what I mean? Normal, not judgmental. Mm. I thought we can get along really well. Uh, and then uh, <coughs> she was a bit of a go-getter like me as well. And she was studying in London. And she said, I want to come to Wakefield to, to see you. And I was like, yeah, no problem. Come to Wakefield. It's two hours on a train, and if you're going to j- jump in a car, it's going to be four hours in the car. Like, yeah, we, I think it was on a Monday, and uh, we arranged to meet on a Thursday. And I, we didn't, st- we ne- unlike now, you know, you can talk mm. on Snap, you can talk on WhatsApp or whatever. We didn't talk every day, so we had conversation maybe every other day. And it came to Thursday, so I'd having a meeting with the guys in, in, in the back office, and it was like a lunch meeting. Anyway, it's a... Uh, uh, my then wife kind of walked into the reception area, and she's like... Is, uh, is Adeem here? And uh, Dave, have you got a meeting? I'm like, no, I haven't got a meeting. Like, There's somebody here for you. And I looked back and I was like, oh, I had a tuna salad sandwich <laughs> on brown bread, which is my staple diet for about 10 years for, for lunch. And I'm like, had half a sandwich in my mouth. And I'm like, oh, yeah, kind of forgot. <laughs> kind of didn't forget, but I forgot. Anyway, I got up and I was like, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, come, on, come on in and... The guy, as, as 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 I was walking into the office, like everybody's looking up and thinking, that, you know, not normal for that to happen. Mm. It's like, okay, we we'll leave you guys to it. We we'll leave you guys to it. And everybody <laughs> walked out of the room. She's walked in. I'm clearing crumbs off the table and picked half a sandwich up and put it in the kitchen. And uh, then she's, uh, I was like, look, I'm sorry about the lunch. We'll go get some lunch. Um, the guys were just eating lunch, making my excuses why I'm having lunch without her. And I said, can I get you a tea or coffee? She said, yeah, I'll have a coffee. So um, that's our big, that's yeah. our big, that's our Big Ben equivalent it's in outside. Wakefield. That's literally outside, oh, yeah. Real. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the, that's the real thing. <laughs> kind of goes off on on the hour. Oh, nice. So um, then what happened there was uh, I went into the kitchen to make teas and coffees, and I brought the brought it back into the the main boardroom, sat, put it on the table, and I looked at her, and she's looking up at the uh, the wall, and then looking at me, then she's looking up at the wall, then she's looking at me. And she looked at the wall again and she looks at me. And then I'm like, why is she doing that for? Anyway, I look at her. Then I look at the wall. I think, oh, my God. That was the, it, we had an entrepreneur award, uh. singlemuslim.com entrepreneur award on the wall. <laughs> and she's like, do you need to tell me something? <laughs> and I was like, I don't do this as a full-time job, by the way. And then, so I just sat down and said, look, if you want to call it a day, let's call it a day. Obviously, I need to get married. Obviously, I'm in the same boat as everybody else. Mm. Obviously, I'm looking. So obvi- you know, I'm using my own platform and, and I thought, why not? And I didn't tell you because I didn't want you to think that this is what I do or this mm. is how I do this and, and so on and so forth. She was kind of like surprisingly okay-ish about it. And we just kind of, you know, went out for lunch and had a comp- had the tea, then went out for lunch Um and I can I think the rest is history. Within within three months, we got married. Mashallah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was a, uh, alhamdulillah, um, four beautiful children. Mashallah. Um, you know, we had uh, 
We had a good uh, good 14 years together. Uh, and then I experienced what a lot of people experience and sadly is very, very common in our society at the moment. And uh, yeah, we sadly kind of broke uh, the, we, yeah, and we're no longer married. Um, but Alhamdulillah, you know, again, it's one of those things where it is a big Alhamdulillah, you know, it's a blessing from Allah. And I think it is a blessing from Allah because I didn't really know what it would be like to be divorced. I didn't really know what it would be like to have, you know, parents, co-parenting. Mm. Uh, and it's, you know, even from myself, from an angle where I come from, you know, I, I do think to myself that I've got quite a, you know, broad perspective on life and I've got an open mind. But it's something that I was very, very judgmental on mm. until I went through the experience and then you realise family, friends, experience, heartache, pain, mm. uh, loneliness. And it makes you a better person. It makes you a, a more, I guess, in terms of wholesome individual, somebody who, who can understand other people's pains and really, you know, in a way, help more people out because mm. you're able to almost feel their pain more. Um, and, yeah, and, and you allow people in to your life who you trust and you you build stronger mm. healthier more solid relationships with with your yeah. own family and, and friends i think the, there's two things with that is uh i guess things that we can take as like benefit to that is is like one obviously <coughs> running a muslim dating website one of the um you know largest in the world that's part of the relationship cycle for so many people that huge are your users and so you have the experience of falling in love getting married no even even the heartbreak you know before that falling in love getting married and then that experience of obviously you know going through that breakup going through that that heartache yeah. and then you know on the other end you know then building up uh, again and so there's so many people on your platform that actually you can now resonate with that before yeah, yeah, you yeah. weren't able to yeah, right yeah, so that yeah. empathy and that experience and so i mean a lot of the things that you you you, you tell me actually in my head i just keep thinking like you know, God is doing this because you are in that leadership capacity and there's so many people that rely upon you and actually the more pain and the more suffering that you go through, the more you're able to empathize. <laughs> I hope you have nothing but an easy life, inshallah, bro. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that these these do these things do happen, obviously, and uh, to certain people for certain reasons. And, um, you know, I think with your mindset, that's only a benefit that can that can come out of that, mashallah. So, 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 so how... I call it, I, I call it a speeding fine. Yes, you know, sometimes yeah. when you when you travel so fast and you mm. do so much, you're gonna get a speeding fine because it's like you know just because you're not you know I guess behaving normally or you know being able to look left or look right or mm. you know it, it's uh, but alhamdulillah like you said it's uh, it's nice that you kind of see it that way because there's no other way you can see it and and the, in leadership your shoulders are are very very heavy on on the burden of responsibility not just for your own decisions, but for the decisions that you're going to mm -hmm. make for the individuals that you lead and for the communities mm -hmm. and the, 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 the organization that you run, because we make a decision at the top, that decision is going to resonate all the way down to the bottom. Mm -hmm. And those people that are, are working for us or the, those people that are using our services are going to feel that and that's going to change their, their course as well. So it's something that, you know, keeps you, keeps me awake at night mm -hmm. and, uh, is 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 a burden that I kind of carry with me, yeah, all the time. And so, so um, with from singlemuslim dot com, then that that transition period, then so in terms of mentality, you're going through you know your own journey of looking for yeah, yeah. for someone. So then again, with with penny appeal, then so what what was the because I know that you were like you mentioned that you went to Pakistan when you were in your teen years and you saw the poverty that was yeah. there. Um, you know, I'm sure you had other trips there throughout your time, obviously. And and then also, you know, once you had elevated to a different status, you were going back there now. Yeah. And again, I'm sure that there was charity that you were giving. Why why did you have this this idea that I want to start my own charity? There was ne there was none of that, to be honest with you. At the at the beginning, there was, I guess, it's just the entrepreneur inside me that kind of come out. Um, you know, I I support a lot of charity, and I still support a lot of charities, and I think Muslim individuals in the Muslim community are doing a fantastic job with some real niche charities and people that are behind it and that are making a massive, massive difference. Um, my own experience was a little bit different, I guess, when 
I started making money. It wasn't just like there was lots of money around and there was just nothing to do with it. Mm. You know, Alhamdulillah, I got married uh, when I was 25. So in 2005, um, and at the same time as single Muslims start to, you know, mm. like, you know, make some something of itself and, and become a, a real business and we were able to take some money out of the business. Uh, so I started establishing myself. Then we had a, a, a young family. So, you know, as much as I could in terms of focusing on the family, focusing on that side, but also focusing on the business, expanding the business, making some investments. Um, and then... I guess, you know, with, with all that money, I, I did feel a bit kind of sick with it all. Because you think to yourself, you know, this is not fair. Like, why is this, why am I making so much money? And why is this happening to me? Because look at all those, uh, and why am I deserving of this? Mm. I'm not deserving of this. Like, you know, I'm, I'm not, I've seen some amazing people in Pakistan. I've seen some amazing people in some, you know, very, very poor countries that are pious, that are religious, that are hardworking, that are grafters, that are beautiful, beautiful people. And they don't have they don't have anything, and I don't feel that I'm that deserving. But I've got all this, and what am I going to do with it? And what am I going to genuinely? What am I going to really? How am I going to be able to, on the day of judgment, how am I going to be able to say, look, I did the right thing? Mm. Yes, you have a lifestyle. Yes, you're able to provide for your family. Yes, you're able to, like, share some of that those blessings with with families and friends and 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 help people out. But then, where does it where does it end? And then I went back to my ancestral home in Pakistan uh, and I used to go for long weekends um, and uh, those long weekends were like, you know, late Thursday, jump on a plane Thursday night, miss the day at the office on a Friday, land in Pakistan six o'clock Friday morning, all day Friday, all day Saturday, catch the early morning flight Sunday, get back to Manchester airport for, for Sunday afternoon. So literally people at the office only miss you for one day. People that, you know, family misses you for maybe two days, three days maximum, mm -hmm. and you've been to Pakistan and back. Um, and that allowed me to be able to kind of be in touch with my roots a little bit more, but also, like, keep it real for me. Because here, you know, you could just keep spending, 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 um, have this, have this. There's never enough, you know what I mean? There's mm -hmm. never enough. But when I went back to Pakistan, I could, you know, I sat on the floor with people from my village. I listened to those stories. Um, I see my own family that, you know, that didn't have anything, like literally nothing. Uh, they relied on the harvest. If they had a bad harvest, they were in debt. Um, and I thought to myself, what would my father do if he was here? He'd, he'd, he'd help out. He'd, he'd do a little bit, give a little bit back. And we met a, a great guy called Ali. And uh, Ali was an awesome, awesome guy. For a, for a village in rural Pakistan, he had a very, very open mind and he was very forward thinking. Mm. And he said, Adim, I tell you what, what you're doing is great. Getting people out of debt, paying for, you know, tractors and paying for this and um, helping with food items and, and a bit of shelter is fantastic. But it's not going to last because mm. you walk away, they're going to, that's just going to, you know, they're going to be a full, full belly for three hours and they're going to be hungry again. Mm. What you really need to do is provide education. And I'm going to help you do that. I'm working five hours away in city, I'm away from my family and, you know, from, from my loved ones. If you sponsor me to set up a school in your father's village, I'm two villages down, I'll come up, mm -hmm. I'll, 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 you know, I'll, I'll educate the youngsters. They don't have to walk to school for miles and miles. Um, and it's a win-win situation. And I says, okay, that's finally, you know, I had a really good relationship with him. I trusted him and I trialed him out. And he only wanted 30 pounds a month. And I thought to myself, what is £30 a month? I was like, yeah, no problem. You know, I would, mm. can you start tomorrow? <laughs> do you know what I mean? And he, could, he really couldn't believe it. And he was so respectful as well. Like he used to do the moonwalk. When I was talking, after we'd finished the conversation, he never used to want to turn his back on me because oh, he's like, okay. turning your back on someone who's seen as, seen as disrespectful. So he'd do a little moonwalk out and he'd come in and he'd say, look, thank, thanks to you, you're able to help these people, help, help my community. Uh, and I'd be like, Ali, thanks to you, I'm able to give you some sadhaka and you're able to take some charity money from me. And I'm, I see that as a good deed. I see that as a, a really a, a massive reward. So I got back from Pakistan. I landed in Manchester. My um, car was empty. And I guess before that, I thought to myself, you know, what am I going to call this? I'm going to call it Single Muslim Foundation because obviously mm. I'm gonna, I can do so much from my own personal money, but... There's only a, that that might get us to to a few schools, or it might get mm. us to a, a few more wells or a few orphan homes. 
but really to get it at a scale. Because in my mind, I'm always thinking about how do you get to the, mm. how do you do maximum amount that you can do. So to get it as a scale, I'm going to have to get the business behind it. So let's call it Single Muslim Foundation. And I always knew that was a bad idea. I thought to myself, that's just like a poor name. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Who, even the single Muslims are not going to donate to the foundation, <laughs> let, <laughs> let alone if you're married or if you're divorced or whatever. It's like, no. Nah. Exactly. Or if you're non-Muslim, like, why do I want to donate to a single Muslim foundation? True. They can help. They can pay for their own wedding. <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> so anyway, I got back from uh, Pakistan, landed at Manchester Airport, picked my car up, and uh, when I started it, it was empty. I thought, okay, get, get to a service station. Got to a service station, and in my mind, I'm still thinking about Ali. I'm still thinking about the great time that I've had in Pakistan. Got the nozzle in there and just going, dzz, filling it up, filling it up, dzz, dreaming about Pakistan, dreaming about all those great people that I've seen and how, how can I help them. And you always have those, you know, before you go to sleep, you're still half in Pakistan. Mm-hmm. When you've had a sleep and a shower, you're like, that was a long, long time ago. So it clicked. And when the nozzle clicked, mm. I looked over and it said 90 pounds. And it said 90 pounds. I thought to myself, 90 pounds is the equivalent of three months of Ali's salary. Three months, which is a quarter of a year. So I've just put in 90 pounds into my car which is equivalent to a quarter of a year for Ali, Ali's wife, Ali's four children, Ali's two parents, his goats, his cows, his bicycle, his house. You know, he's responsible for so many, you know, 40, 50 children in that village. Um, 90 pounds, like, what am I doing? Like, oh my God, like, the guilt was massive. Mm. And I thought, you know what, there has to be a, there has to be a way that we're able to help more people like Ali and people like me who put 90 pounds into their car, pay 40 pounds for a gym membership, pay 40 pounds for a mobile phone, pay God knows how many pounds a day for a cappuccino and cupcakes and bits and pieces that Mm. we don't need. Why do we need to buy that water? Yorkshire water is good quality enough anyway. Why do I need to buy a bottled Mm. bot? Why do I need to buy an Oasis? I don't need to do that. You know, that's... That's, that's a lot of money. That's hundreds of pounds a month that mm. I don't need to, I don't need to spend, but I spend, but I could help somebody like Ali. And on that forecourt in Manchester is where Penny Appeal was born because it's about the pennies, mm. not about the pounds. And again, the strap line just came to my mind, which was small change, big difference. Mm. It's just small, it's affordable, but it's highly rewardable. Mm. And those small acts of kindness. And I later found out that it's a, it's a son of the, the beloved prophet He's be upon awesome. him as well in terms of, you know, doing something small but regular mm. rather than having these great massive acts of, uh, you know, like grandeur. Let's just do something which is small, but which is regular, and that can benefit other people. And then other people are doing small but regular acts. And that compound effect is is is, is going to be so much more. And then that's, that's, that's where the idea came to mind. And I thought, no, I must do something. I've got to really do something. And I went back to the office and, uh, yeah, kind of like tapped the guys again. I said, look, guys, there's another... But I used to have these ideas on a regular basis. So some of them, they're like, yeah, he's going to go to sleep. He'll forget about it tomorrow. But some that were that were passionate about, like, single Muslim, that were passionate about, like, the, the charity. Like, I kept reminding them again and again and again. And there was a chap called Steve Roper um, who built the state, the first uh, Penny Peel website, a single Muslim tech guy there was another guy called lewis who helped me um who who set up the database um so again i mean to say that it's a muslim charity we've Mm. had we've had muslim leadership but it's never been a muslim charity Mm. uh our first donor uh was a chap called dave another dave (laughs) (laughs) but still dave um and i and that was an interesting that was an interesting conversation as well because dave was telling me about his holiday so dave is a client Dave's telling me about his um, his uh, luxury five star holiday to Disneyland, Florida. Telling me about his ho- helicopter rides and his five star hotels and swimming with dolphins. He's got a glowing tan and he's like, you know, before you, s- you know, in, in, in a typical meeting before you start the the work, like yeah, I've been away and we've done this and we've done that. He's like, Adim, you've got a bit of a tan as well. Where have you been? what do I tell Dave you know like I'm a bit <laughs> embarrassed here do I tell him about the diarrhea do I tell him about the vomiting <laughs> do I show him the mosquito bites anyway I started like okay l- I like Dave Dave's not gonna judge me so I started talking to Dave about um the Pakistan trip and the wells and the orphans and Ali and 
the plans and you know so on and so forth and as i'm talking to dave and as I, as i'm winding my story down thinking what's dave thinking <laughs> you know i mean what's dave feeling about me now you know i mean some pakistani guy that he's dealing with and he's telling me about all these problems in pakistan he, pick, he picks up his uh, briefcase and he pulls out his checkbook and he's right at him i want to support what you're doing i was like wow you want to support what i'm doing he's like yeah i want to support what you're doing how much do you need for whatever you need i want to i want to i want to donate to you i thought you know what Dave, I'm not going to take your money right now because if I take your money and I drive in and and I'm pull up in a nice car tomorrow if I or if I have a nice suit or if I you know I'm going to feel a bit guilty because I'm mm. thinking like taking Dave's money and Dave needs some transparency. So I said to Dave, Dave, don't give me that check yet. Let me set up a charity. I want to call the charity Penny Peel. And then once I've set the charity up, you can donate to the charity. And that's exactly what I did. So it was the idea on the forecourt. Mm. And then it was the kind of that manifested itself into the meeting with Dave, mm. and Dave actually pushing some money onto me, and I'm like, Dave, I can't take the money until we've set up the charity. So we had some really good um, people who helped me set up with the the governance documents and the structure and the the kind of the aims of the charity and the five year plan and so on and so forth. And then we set the charity up, and I knocked on Dave's door and I said, Dave, we're ready for your donation now. And lo and behold, Dave, Dave, Dave came good with his donation, and uh, he's still a, a regular donor. Uh, and alhamdulillah, that was the that was. And I see, I don't see it as a charity. People say to me, "Oh, it's a, it's a charity, and it's a, you know, it's an NGO, or whatever it might be, and 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 what 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 not." And I say, you know, it's it's not. It's actually a it's actually a movement. It's a movement of good, mm-hmm. and it's a movement from good people, and it's actually a bedrock of the British Muslim community. And it's a it's a change of habits and a change of it's a change of culture in terms of what we do. You know, like back in the days, our parents knew somebody. Our parents were from a village or from a town or a city in the developing world, and they'd they'd have that direct link back to those individuals. Mm-hmm. But now that link has glossed, so people want to do good. It's natural, you know. Our core as humans is to do good, regardless of our faith. And when we, when we want to do good, what? How do we do that good? And I guess it's my kind of like trade or it's my kind of like passion that I'm able to kind of like relay that message across to people and say, look, this is how you can do good. This is what you can do and this Mm -hmm. is how you can support. And we've had we've had waves of success. And now Penny Peel is, uh, you know, we've got (coughs) offices in seven different countries here in the UK, Canada, America, South Africa, Australia, Dubai, Pakistan. And those offices then, you know, every single day, bank holidays, Christmas days, birthdays, whatever, you know, those offices are working day in, day and night, constantly, you know, fundraising, helping people and, and, and pushing that kind of message across. So that that one small change that mm. I guess happened, small change that happened to me, some people would say is a big change. It's like definitely a life changing change that happened to me as a six year old child, mm. all the way through to you know, being able to be financially independent with single Muslim, wanting to call a charity Single Muslim Foundation, <laughs> <laughs> and giving it a proper name and proper independence, like Penny Peel, mm. and, that, and then setting that up. Now that that movement has been, stakeholders in that movement are people that are, you know, global, mm. that have got offices in, in, in several different countries, and pushing that message across and, and really doing the, the essence of that good work and Helping million, millions and millions of people. You know, we've made over 150 million pounds that we've, you know, received for for good. And inshallah, it's an institution now, and it's going to outlive us, and it's going to outlive our generations and generations. And we'll be able to look back when we're, you know, in the hereafter and say, look, we we planted a seed, and that seed's good, done done good now for us, mm. and that'll be our sadaqah jariya for us and for our children. And inshallah. For my father uh, and for many, many other fathers that are no longer with us, grandfathers, grandmothers, mothers, sisters, brothers, children, and all the Sadhguru Jari that people have donated towards loved ones that are, and deceased family members and friends that are no longer with us, inshallah. And I, and I think, you know, the kind of core thing for me that I go back to and that I remember is that, you know, I just ex- I just wish and pray that Allah accepts from, mm, from yeah, me. Okay. And, and I mean... And Allah accepts from all of us in terms of accepting the good work that we do and, uh, you know, helping us through the challenges that we have and uh, forgiving our shortcomings. 
I mean, I mean. Bro, we've only got uh, a couple minutes left and then you have to um, jet off uh, to uh, to Dublin. Uh, so I just want to close off on, I guess, um, usually I like to just ask a, a question to my guest and direct the answer straight to the audience. And so with yourself then, I think, you know, y- you sit on both sides of the fence in terms of um, business and entrepreneurship, which is often seen as, you know, businessmen and entrepreneurs, you know, they're very greedy for money and that's why they're there, <laughs> right? And then you sit on the other fence, as we said, you're a philanthropist, you own your own charity or maybe own is the wrong word to say, you know, you started a charity, you run it, you provide the vision and, and that kind of, that net for people to put their donations into, right? That's, you provide that service. So you sit on both sides of this and, you know, you yourself, Marshall, have gained what most people would assume as success, um, you know, both financially as well as spiritually, mashallah. Alhamdulillah. So, and also you uh, you touched upon, obviously, you know, the network of people that you know and a lot of the donors, etc. So what I'm really trying to ask is, what do you notice about the common traits about the most successful people that you deal with and that you think yourself has made you successful? Okay, that's a a secret to success. I I guess action, being people of action. Um, Talk is good, theory is good, um, design is good, uh, foundations are good, foundations are great, but you've got to start building on that and you've got to start, you've got to get out there. Um, So action, hunger. Hunger is another one. And I guess the third one for me is passion. Mm. You know, because action is good, but you're going to be action without passion. You've got to have hunger hunger because you've got to have that drive. Um, and if that hunger goes, then you might have the passion, but you might just have a passion for talking. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You might have action, but you might have action on the golf course, but you want to be doing the action for the, for the passion that you have. And passion, you know, like people say to me, like, I'm going to give that job to somebody else or I'm going to talk to somebody else about this idea because you're too busy. But I think, you know, for me, passion always makes time. If you're passionate for mm. something, you always make time, whether it's pre-breakfast, breakfast, whether it's, I don't know, Friday evening, sounds like I don't have a life, but or Saturday morning or Sunday afternoon, you know, passion makes time. So those, I guess those three are the, the, the key ingredients. And, you know, and then just being sincere with it, like, you know, the longevity is, is the sincerity that you have and mm. the... The fact that you know you're not you're not doing it for for me or I, you're doing it for we, and you're doing it for the the and, and just get stakeholders in there, you know, because your success as single, you're not gonna, you might be able to run fast, but you're not gonna get the distance. Mm. And if you've got a group of people that believe in this together, you're gonna have off days, you're gonna have busy days, you're gonna have time when you're not there. But if you're not there, you're you've you've gone to the hereafter. And who's going to carry on that legacy? Who's going to carry on that movement? And where is that going to go to? And how long? How long before that fizzles? Mm. So yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's my kind of answer to that. No, I, hope exactly that okay, I, hope, I hope that answers. No, no, question. no, it does. It does. <laughs> and, and just the other day, actually, I was thinking about how important passion is because without passion, you can't get that consistency because you won't mm. want to do it. And um, yeah, I mean, even even with doing this type of stuff, it surprises me sometimes. That like I'm up at certain times and you know still working <laughs> and and then I realize the time afterwards you know and that's when you realize okay this you yeah, know yeah, yeah. you know, it surprises myself like oh that's yeah. the passion you know that's and then that gives me the confidence okay we keep doing this because you know all these emotions all these feelings obviously some of it has to come from God right so um, it's, a su- it's a Sunday afternoon bro and you're you're here and you've got your kit and caboodle and you've that's you've it, made the time to 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 come to our I call it the center of the universe Wakefield <laughs> you've come to Wakefield and you've come to see me so. And, and also, I guess, you know, the other, the other thing that we don't think about on a startup is diversity. Mm. You know, Allah has made us all very different. Allah has created the races, created, created different languages, created variety. And you have to have that variety in what you do as well in terms of your team mm. that we've had naturally. That's part of our kind of DNA. And that, that gives you a, a lot of different color. And that gives you a lot of brains to, to, to solve the problems and it makes you make it easy in fact it makes it difficult sometimes because you've got too many answers <laughs> but that's another story exactly uh before we end this and before the camera start turning off um 
we have got a little bit of a surprise for all of you guys watching, right? So we're going to do a giveaway. So if you don't know, Adim has actually written an autobiography called Small Change, Big Difference, based upon, obviously, the Penny Appeal story. Yeah. Um, I bought a copy for myself and I was reading it. And actually, it's a very easy read. Like, you, you want, it's very engaging. You want to keep reading Thank it. Um, and so I thought to myself, you know, what better way than to actually do a giveaway for you guys watching? So for anybody who wants to own that book, and we've actually got it signed as well from Adeem, so yeah. Adeem's actually signed it, mashallah. So if you want to own that copy, and it's of the signed copy uh, of Adeem's book, then make sure you're subscribed to this channel, and make sure you're following Adeem and myself on Instagram. Do they need to do anything else, Penny Appeal? They need to follow Penny Appeal as well. So if you can, uh, if you can DM me proving that you subscribed uh, to my channel and you're following Adeem, Penny Appeal, and myself on Instagram, then uh, I'll pick a I'll pick a winner and we'll send that book over to them, inshallah. So don't forget single Muslim for all those single people out there. Yeah, you have to follow single Muslim <laughs> as well. We've added that in now. Okay, so if you follow those uh, channels, then uh, send me a DM proving it, and we'll get the book out to one lucky winner. So Jazakallah um, my bro. I think um, we definitely probably need to do this uh, again and do a part two because we've only got to the penny appeal story. Like, <laughs> yeah, we just started really on penny appeal. So there's a whole raft of things. There's so oh, much really. I want to talk to you about. You know the different stories that you have with Penny Appeal going out there, the things that you've seen, mashallah. So, yeah, I think, um, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely do this again. And um, for now, I'm going to let you go on to your flight, inshallah. So thanks exactly. so much. Any last words before we uh, end things? Uh, no, just Jazakallah just, just, thank you for doing what you're doing. I no, think it's, it's great. You, we've got to, I guess, as leaders and being in the leadership role, we've got to share what we know, share our knowledge and uh, inspire others as much as we can and be, uh, be, be, some, be people that we can, you know, help others up. Uh, whilst we're for this very short limited period of time that we, we we have something how do we help more people from our community from our faith um join us in the in in that success so exactly have to you and to your to, to the great work that you're doing Barak Afik, bro. much appreciated my bro and um yeah thank you so much for those kind words and we'll see you on the next one take care